In this lesson, we'll try to understand how cells in the brain can have preferred stimuli that are more complicated than simple edges of different orientations. In particular, we'll try to understand how cells may have a preferred stimulus for a face. Well, you'll recall that uh, we attempted to explain the presence of orientation cells or edge detecting cells in the visual cortex. And our explanation involved this principle of spatial summation. And here's another look at that concept. The target cell down here is receiving four inputs. And the idea is that the activity in the target cell will depend on the activity of the pattern of activity of the inputs. If input one only is active, the target cell's response may be uh, very small or not at all. But as you get simultaneous activity of more and more inputs, then the target cell cell's activity increases until you get a maximum response. When all four inputs are simultaneously activated, we get the maximum response. We call this spatial summation because these are spatially distinct synapses, but when they're simultaneously activated, then that uh, uh, creates a situation where you easily pass threshold and the target cell will respond with an output. We can think of this as a form of computation as well. It involves integrating the inputs to generate an output signal, and depending on the pattern of inputs, the output signal is different. Now, another way to think about the preferred stimulus for this target cell is the preferred stimulus is that stimulus which activates the largest set of those inputs, right? And that's going to cause the maximal response. So, in a previous lesson, we, we thought of this target cell as being an edge-detecting cell, receiving inputs from other cortical cells that mapped onto the retina in a certain spatial way so that different uh, cortical cells would respond to vertical edges or horizontal edges or diagonal edges, etc. Now we'll sort of use our understanding to understand how a cell uh, could uh, respond in a preferential way to a face. To begin, let's imagine now we have a sheet of the cerebral cortex and all, and we have clusters of these lines. Now these lines represent cells with a preferred uh, stimulus orientation. So here is a, a, a vertical edge detector, here's a, a diagonal edge detector, horizontal edge detector, a different diagonal edge detecting cell. So these would be cortical cells and the orientation of the line would be its preferred orientation. And we have clusters of these cells laid out in a map. And remember the visual cortex is like a map of the retina. So these edge detecting cells stand ready to analyze whatever object we're looking at and then uh, different objects are going to activate different patterns of these edge detecting cells in a s spatially uh, determined way. So let's take a look at how the m that might. Okay, so let's say over here, this is our retina, and out in the world is someone's face. The face is being processed by this region of the retina, and we're going to simplify the face as sort of the eyes that we can think of as two horizontal lines, the nose a vertical line, and the mouth um, a horizontal line. So the suggestion is that up in the cortex, in the visual cortex, there's a certain pattern of activation of the edge detecting cells. So for example, this eye here is um, represented by activity right here, in this uh, uh, horizontal edge detecting cell. The eye that's displaced, right, that's over here, is going to be uh, activating a spatially distinct orientation cell, but also a horizontal edge detector, right? And so the, the activity of these two cells is, in a sense, representing the presence of these two eyes on the face. Likewise, the nose is going to activate this uh, horizontal or this uh, vertical edge detecting cell, and the mouth perhaps is uh, represented by activity down here. So notice if these particular uh, edge detecting cells, if the nature of their axons is such that they converge on a target cell, then this cell is in a situation where simultaneous activity of uh, its inputs would happen when a face is, is at this position on the retina. And so activity of the cell will be maximum when, it's, uh, w when that face is present. And therefore, the preferred stimulus for this cell is a face, and we can say the activity of the cell represents the presence of this face. 
Now, this is obviously a tremendous simplification of what's going on in, in brains. But the, uh, the, the, at a conceptual level, this is a, this is a common notion of, of how we might begin to build uh, a, a visual system in which cells start to have more complicated preferred stimuli. So early visual regions, like the regions that uh, detect edges, can feed information forward, and the axons from these cells can converge in certain ways, setting up uh, target cells that have certain preferred stimuli. So if a different face comes along with, uh, with different sort of boundary features and features on the face, it's going to activate a slightly different set of these uh, edge-detecting cells. And uh, perhaps they, uh, a different face, the uh, relevant axons would would uh, all converge on a different cell. And so that other cell would come to represent uh, the presence of a different face on the retina. So we said the fusiform seemed to be processing the invariant aspects of the face related to the identity of the person. Well, people have different faces, right? The faces look different. So different faces are going to activate different sets of uh, edge-detecting cells in the, on, uh, in the visual cortex. And again, the idea is due to the nature of the wiring and the convergence of, of these cells, you can set up a situation where uh, uh, target cells are going to respond to a certain preferred stimulus face and not another face, whereas other cells will respond to different faces and not that face that is currently on the retina. Okay, so let's uh, recap with uh, a couple extra notes here. So first of all, the simultaneous activity of all of the inputs will generate the maximum response. And so that would be a situation that we would identify that the preferred stimulus is setting up activity in all of the inputs, and that's why you get a maximum response here. Uh, we can look at it the other way around. The cell's activity represents the presence of the face, the presence of the preferred stimulus at that location on the retina. For non-preferred stimuli, so a different face, for example, only some of the inputs will be active at the same time. But remember, as soon as you start to, to take away some of the activity of some of these inputs, you get a reduced response. So a different face is going to um, cause some of these inputs to drop out. They're not going to be activated because the, the features of the face won't activate that same set of uh, orientation cells uh, in the visual cortex. So non-preferred stimuli will show a reduced response. So the, the cell becomes selective for a certain face, not other faces. And it's useful to see now, uh, re recall the fusiform uh, showed reduced activity to inverted faces. Imagine, what is an inverted face? Well, using our simplified schema here, imagine this stimulus on the retina. Notice the arrangement of the uh, horizontal and the vertical portions here would be different than an upright face. For an inverted face, the uh, horizontal um, eyes here, the eyes here, would be uh, activating horizontal cells down on the lower portion of the diagram. The nose might get similar activity, so this input might remain active for the inverted face, but these cells would no longer be active. Instead, you'd have just a hor one horizontal uh, cell here. So in other words, if if you just invert this pattern of activity here, it's it's a different pattern of activity, and the only common element might be that nose input. Well, when you reduce the the number of inputs to the target cell, you get reduced response. So this cell is not going to respond to an inverted face, but it does respond to the preferred to the preferred upright face.